Hello? We don't seem to have a connection. Can you hear me? Hi, how are you? Uh, hello, we hear each other now. Good. Hello, Mr. Greenwald. We welcome uh, to uh, the session of the um, Committee of Inquiry of the European Parliament. Uh, we have about an hour for this session, um, and I'm first going to invite you to, uh, to do your, your presentation, and then afterwards uh, we'll, uh, have, we'll take questions and answers. So, very pleased to, to have you with us here uh, today. I'll give you the floor, or the, the video link, uh, rather. The um, floor is yours. Great, good afternoon and, and thank you to the committee for convening this inquiry and for inviting me to speak to you as well. There has been a virtual avalanche of stories and reports over the last six months regarding espionage and electronic surveillance by the NSA and its partners and each of these stories has been extremely important but I think that the quantity of them has sometimes endangered um, the ultimate point from being obscured. And so I just wanted to spend a little bit of time discussing what I think is the primary revelation, the crux of all of these stories that ties them together and that I think is the most important thing for us to realize. And that is what the ultimate goal of the NSA is, along with its most loyal one might say subservient junior partner, the British agency GCHQ, when it comes to the reason why the system of suspicionless surveillance is being built. And the objective of this system is nothing less than the elimination of individual privacy worldwide. And at first glance, that might seem like it's a bit hyperbolic, like it's a little bit melodramatic, but it isn't. It's, an, it's a literal description of what the NSA and its closest surveillance partners are attempting to achieve. And the reason that I know that that's what they're attempting to achieve is because this is what they say over and over and over again. On occasion, they say it publicly, and repeatedly they say it in their private documents, which were written when they thought nobody was able to hear what it was that they were saying. There are instances where Keith Alexander, the general who is the chief of the NSA, has made comments uh, along the lines of uh, the objective of the NSA is to collect all signals intelligence, all forms of, of electronic communication by and between human beings. And when this was first reported in The Guardian and elsewhere, the NSA tried to dismiss it as sort of a literary illusion or even a joke. It's no joke. Um, throughout the NSA documents, there re appears continuously all sorts of references to the fact that the goal of the NSA is captured by the phrase, collect it all. Whenever the US and its four closest uh, surveillance partners meet each year at a signals development conference, the four uh, closest surveillance partners being the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, there are constant inclusions of slogans like collect it all or know it all or exploit it all uh, throughout all of these documents. This is actually the mission of the NSA. And one of the ways that you see this mission manifest is that there are numerous programs that the NSA develops and pursues that have no real purpose other than to identify the few pockets of communication that still exist on the planet that the NSA hasn't yet quite successfully invaded. And the NSA is obsessed institutionally with the idea that there are still places and methods that exist that are impervious to their invasion and they work every day to try and rectify what they see as this problem. The problem being that there are still places on the planet that human communication can take place without their collecting, storing, monitoring, and analyzing that communication. So there are documents devoted, for example, to trying to understand how better to invade the Wi-Fi systems on airplanes, 
based on the concern that human beings can still go on airplanes and use the internet or, or mobile phones for a few hours um, in their lives and, and not be susceptible to their surveillance net. There are documents that discuss ways to circumvent advanced encryption tools out of fear that individuals will develop the means to be able to communicate with one another privately without the NSA being able to invade those communications. And so what we're really faced with is not just the creation of the most pervasive system of suspicionless surveillance ever built in human history, although we certainly are faced with that. But it is beyond that. It is an institution that has embedded into its mandate the mission to ensure that human beings can no longer communicate with one another electronically with any degree of privacy. Simply in an, through, through institutional inertia, there is an effort to collect everything. And over the past six months, I've done a lot of reporting in many different countries about espionage targeted at many different populations. And everywhere I do this reporting, I do interviews with newspapers or television programs in those countries. And I am always asked, why interest in Sweden? Why are they so interested in what people who are Swedes are discussing? Or why is the obsessed with collecting all of the communications of Brazilians or any number of other countries. And the answer I always give is the answer that comes directly from the NSA's document, which is that the NSA and its, and its, Europe and its, and its Five Eyes partners don't need any specific reason to collect anybody's communications. Just the fact that human beings are communicating with one another is reason enough for the NSA to decide that it should be collected and stored and monitored. They don't need specific rationale. Their only rationale is that nobody should be able to communicate without the NSA's being able to invade the communication. And every one of the stories that we've done, every one of the specific stories, is driven by this overarching theme. And that's why I think it's fair to say that the significance of this reporting and of what Mr. Snowden uh, revealed to the world really can't be overstated. Um, if governments are devoted to the elimination of privacy worldwide, as the U.S., the U.K., and its three partners are clearly devoted to doing, that has profound consequences for everybody who communicates electronically, which is most people on the planet. And at the very least, it's something that we ought to be discussing and debating openly, if not figuring out how to stop. Uh, the second point I wanted to make um, is I wanted to discuss a little bit what some of the reaction has been to our reporting, um, especially in Europe, but also around the world, because I think it reveals a very important point. It was back in late June, so five months ago or so, that Der Spiegel first reported that the NSA was targeting ordinary Germans by the hundreds of millions for collection of the metadata of their telephone records. And the reaction of the German government was very muted. There were some symbolic gestures to objecting, but by and large, it was very restrained, the reaction. There wasn't very much of, a, of an effort to really do anything about it. And it really wasn't until Der Spiegel was able to reveal that not only ordinary Germans, but even the German chancellor, Angela Merkel, was the target of this surveillance system? Did the German government finally react with genuine indignation and, and decided that it needed to do something about it? And I think in, and that, that's a pattern that has repeated itself in, in other countries as well, sort of apathy and indifference when it's revealed that the population is being targeted with mass surveillance, but true anger when governments find out that they themselves are targeted. And I think part of the, the, what explains that interesting dichotomy is the fact that political officials often tend to be concerned about their own interests and not the interests of the citizens whom they're ostensibly representing. But I think the broader point has been this idea that as long as the NSA is quote unquote only collecting, then we can live with that level of intrusion. But when it comes to listening to people's cell phone calls or reading their emails, that's when genuine outrage is warranted. And I just want to spend a moment addressing this point, because I think it's probably the single greatest misconception in the reporting that we've been doing. If you talk to surveillance experts, as I know that you're doing, what you will hear, I think, almost by consensus at this point around the world is that metadata is not simply 
almost as invasive as content interception or even as invasive. In, in most cases, in most meaningful senses, collection of metadata is now more invasive than interception of content. And it isn't just surveillance experts who think that way, it's the NSA itself. Throughout these documents appears the recognition that collecting metadata is the supreme priority of the agency, not because it protects people's privacy, but precisely because it enables the NSA to invade people's privacy more effectively than the interception of content. And I think sometimes it's difficult to understand that in the abstract, but it's easy to understand it when concrete examples are used. And so if you can imagine, for example, a woman who decides that she wants to get an abortion, if you're listening in on her phone call, what you will hear is her calling a clinic. The clinic will answer with a generic sounding name like Eastside Clinic or something like that. You will hear the woman who, who, who you've decided to target for surveillance ask for an appointment Tuesday at 2 o'clock, get an appointment Tuesday at 2 o'clock, and then hang up the phone, and you'll have no idea what, why she called or even what kind of clinic she called or what the purpose was. But if you're collecting her metadata, you will see the phone number that she called. You will then be able to identify it as an abortion clinic. You will know how many times she called that clinic and you will have exactly the information that you wouldn't get if you were simply listening to her phone call. The same with somebody who has HIV and calls a doctor specializing in HIV once every three months, as HIV patients often do. If you're listening to their phone calls, you'll have no idea what kind of doctor they're calling, but if you're collecting their metadata, you'll know everything about their medical condition. The same with somebody who calls a suicide hotline or a drug addiction clinic or somebody who is speaking with someone who is not their spouse late at night, or any number of other types of intimate activities that human beings engage in that you probably wouldn't be able to apprehend if you're reading their emails or listening to their telephone calls, but that you will instantly be able to understand by collecting their metadata. And then beyond that, there are very sophisticated, increasingly sophisticated tools for analyzing metadata when it's collected in mass, to be able to understand not only who your targets are speaking to, but who those people are speaking to, and then who those people are. And to develop a very comprehensive picture of the network of associations and friends of various individuals, but also of the society generally, to have a very invasive understanding of the private behavior, the private associations, the private thoughts of the people who, under whom, uh, who, whom you've placed under surveillance by collection of metadata. It really is the case that if you're somebody who values privacy, it would almost be preferable at this point to have the NSA listening to your phone calls and reading your emails than it is for them to collect all of your metadata over the course of many years and be able to link it to everybody else's metadata and then analyze it in secret virtually no restraints as the NSA, the GCHQ, and its surveillance partners are doing. The third point I wanted to, to make and, and just talk about briefly is the of, of individual privacy. There's often this sense that I think Western governments have to inculcate people to accept that privacy doesn't really have much value that it's essentially a luxury, that if you've done nothing wrong, you have nothing to hide, all the sorts of cliches that have been manufactured and then disseminated to get populations accustomed to an invasion of their privacy. And I think that although there's a perception that it's possible, I think in reality it can't work and hasn't worked because human beings instinctively understand why privacy actually is vital. That's why they put passwords on their email accounts and their social media networks. It's why they put locks on their bedroom and bathroom doors. It's why if you propose that you put video cameras in their homes to monitor everything they're doing to protect them from invaders or criminals, they would react with repulsion because human beings instinctively understand that privacy is a critical component of what it means to be a free human being. And I think, though, that it's worth just spending a minute to underscore why that is. And I think we all have this understanding that 
when we know that we are being watched by other people, when we know that other people are casting a judgmental examination upon our choices and our behaviors, our behavior is much different than when we act in a private realm. When we think other people are watching us, we make choices that conform to orthodoxies that are designed to avoid behavior deemed to be shameful. Essentially, we take, we make choices to fulfill the expectations that other people in the broader society have of us. We become conformists. We conform to mores and norms. When we have a realm that we can go into where we're confident that we're not being watched, can we test boundaries? Can we engage in creativity and dissent? Can we violate orthodoxies? That is essentially the realm in which human freedom exclusively resides, when we can decide for ourselves what kind of choices we want to make. In a society in which the private realm is abolished, in which human beings know that they're susceptible to being watched at any time, and I think that's the key, not necessarily that every one of their emails is being read, but that their emails and telephone calls can be monitored by unseen agencies, just the knowledge that your behavior is subjected to the possibility of surveillance is a society that breeds conformity. It's a society in which individuals will have the range of choices that are available to them severely constricted. And it's why every tyranny, every despot, every oppressive government loves a surveillance state, precisely because it eliminates human choice and breeds conformity and really severely reduces the amount of freedom that as individuals we have. And that's why I think that beyond the political implications or the theoretical and legal implications, there are very serious consequences for what it means to be a, a free individual to live in a state like the one that we're moving to in which the surveillance is both invisible and yet ubiquitous. The final point I wanted to make um, is that I began by saying that I, I'm glad that, that this committee has convened this, this inquiry and that we're able to have this opportunity to discuss all of these issues. And I just want to remind everybody that there's only one reason why we're able to have the discussion that we're having today and why we have the knowledge and information that we now possess about this system. And that one reason is the brave and quite self-sacrificing decision of my source for this story, Edward Snowden, to risk everything in his life that he had, career stability and personal relationships and the ability to be a free citizen um, in order to bring it to all of our attention. And there are governments all over the world, in fact, most governments all over the world, who are extreme beneficiaries of Mr. Snowden's choice. Human beings all over the world consider him a hero. Governments have been able to realize how their privacy is being invaded, to take steps to reform the abuses that we now know about, um, to convene investigations like the one that we're here to participate in today. All sorts of people, all kinds of governments all over the world exploiting for their own interests and their own benefit the very brave sacrifice that Mr. Snowden made. And I'm glad to see that they're doing that. And I know that he is as well, very gratified that, that governments are taking so seriously what it is that he has shown them. But what has happened is that although there are lots of governments who have taken advantage of the choice that he made and the sacrifice and bravery that he's shown, there are very, very few governments, in fact, a tiny handful, who are extending a reciprocal courtesy to him of protecting his rights the way that he decided to protect all of ours. And because of that, he currently is in a situation that's very uncertain, where his own government is attempting to subject him to serious persecution, to put him in a cage for decades, if not the rest of his life, for having come forward and shown a light on much of this behavior that is illegal and certainly abusive. Um, and yet, most governments around the world have decided to turn their back, not only on him, but on their own obligations, ethically and, and legally, to protect people, such as Mr. Snowden, from persecution by granting them asylum. And I think it's a very strange and disappointing uh, dynamic to watch governments in Europe um, express indignation over what he has revealed and to take steps to protect themselves against it, while at the same time turning their back on him and allowing his own government to threaten him 
with life in prison. And I would hope that, that governments around the world will not only decide to try and exploit his revelations for their own interests, but also to express gratitude for what it is that he did by protecting his of the world's most powerful factions and not be sent to prison for the rest of your life for having done it. So with that, I thank you once again very much for, for inviting me. I'm happy to have a discussion with any of you who have questions. Okay, thank you very much for your, um, for your uh, introduction. Uh, now we're going to go to questions and answers, and I hope that the connection will remain stable enough. Uh, I've, I, I understand that there is, uh, that we can speak our own language and you will get translation into English, but that, the, that you, our colleagues here, do not get any translation, or do you? No, okay. Okay, but you should get translation into, into English, so please signal if there's a problem. And I'm also going to ask both colleagues and our, our, um, our guest to be as brief and concise as possible and to allow for a maximum number of questions. Um, so we'll have one, one question, one answer uh, each time, and I'll ask everybody to really be very, very concise. First of all, we'll listen to the rapporteur, Mr. Claude Moraes of the S&D Group. Okay, thank you, Mr. Greenwald, for taking the time to be here today. Uh, could I begin uh, where you finished um, on the, um, the source, Edward Snowden? Um, in my report, I'm going to be talking about uh, whistleblower protection. Yesterday, uh, we saw the Congressional Committee led by Mike Rogers, uh, and they rejected um, the definition of Mr. Snowden as a whistleblower. Uh, they said he wasn't a whistleblower. Um, What's your view of that? Uh, because by rejecting that definition, uh, they, of course, are seeing him as a felon. Um, simple question, what's your view of that? Because it, of course, then leads to a whole set of consequences. Secondly, um, on the federal court judgment, which you welcomed, again, that congressional committee, but also Diane Feinstein and others have been saying that it's one of many judgments. This is a really important judgment for us and for our report. Uh, because it, it begins to perhaps define uh, for the first time uh, this whole question of metadata as you have been describing it as perhaps being um, significant that something has happened. Now you welcome the judgment but we are now hearing voices uh, saying that this is not significant, the judgment is not significant. Tell us what you think. Um, and finally, um, the issue um, about the Guardian reporting that you've been doing, how do you answer critics? who say that the reporting um, is putting people in danger or it's inappropriate. Um, my understanding is that you redacted all sorts of information, but please answer those critics. Um, and finally, uh, we had a European Parliament debate on the issue of David Miranda. If you feel it's appropriate, uh, please comment on uh, the issue of how anti-terrorism uh, powers were used in that instance. Thank you. Greenwald. Great. So I'll just take those in order. Um, I uh, yeah, I, I'll just take those in order. I think Mike Rogers picked a, a very bad week to deny that Mr. Snowden is a whistleblower, given the, the federal court decision that you referenced in the second part of your question, which is that the core program that was the first one that we revealed and that Mr. Snowden, when I first met with him, cited as what caused him to come forward namely the collection of the metadata of all Americans um, without regard to suspicion or evidence of wrongdoing, that it violates the core guarantee of the United States Constitution, and the court said it isn't even really close. So somebody who comes forward and reveals a program that a federal court in the United States says violates the Constitution and is therefore illegal is the classic whistleblower. Um, on top of the fact that his revelations have sparked a debate in the United States and around the world, as evidenced by the hearing that we're participating in today, about all sorts of things that I think everybody on all sides of the debate agrees we're better off knowing about. And that is a classic whistleblower, somebody who reveals to the public evidence of wrongdoing, um, as well as illegality, um, and that sparks very important debates that no democratic society can be without, and that is exactly what Mr. Snowden has done. It makes him the classic whistleblower. As far as the court opinion that, that you asked about, 
What generally happens in the United States when it comes to surveillance is the only courts that ever rule on these programs are courts that no Western democracy would even recognize as courts. They're tribunals that meet in secret and where only one side, namely the U.S. government, is permitted to be present and heard. What happened yesterday is the first time a real court proceeding has actually evaluated the legality of these surveillance programs. And the judge's opinion, which I really urge everybody around the world to read, it's not only about U.S. law, but it's about the way in which these programs destroy the concept of individual privacy and how the rationale offered by the U.S. government is false, namely that it helps terrorism. The judge said there's zero evidence that it has stopped terrorism. Um, this opinion was issued by one of the most respected national security judges in the United States. He's not known as a liberal, quite the opposite. He's a conservative judge appointed by President Bush. Um, and yet what he said is that the national security rationale offered by the government is not only false, but woefully inadequate to justify the very serious privacy infringements that the collection of metadata imposes on everybody who is subjected to it. And given the gravity of the opinion, how vehement it was, and the fact that it was issued by this judge, I think is, is quite vital. Um, as far as the, the third question, which is responding to my critics, it's, it's really remarkable because um, although we have been criticized for with disclosing documents which um, put people in danger, I've actually been pretty vehemently criticized from the other direction as well, which is namely that we have published too few documents, that we've withheld too many, that we've gone too slow in, in how we publish these documents. And I actually consider that criticism to be vastly more persuasive and valid than the one that says that we put people in danger. Terrorists have long known that the U.S. and the U.K. governments and lots of other governments are doing everything possible to monitor their communications. Osama bin Laden famously used human couriers to communicate with his associates precisely because all terrorists already know that everything that they're doing on the internet or the telephones is subject to being monitored by various governments. We didn't tell terrorists anything that they didn't already know. What we told people that they didn't already know was that not the terrorists, but that they themselves, innocent people, are the real targets of this mass surveillance system. And we haven't harmed national security or put in danger anyone's lives. The only thing we've harmed is the perception of honesty and the credibility of Western leaders who have built this massive surveillance system in the dark. And then the final point about the, the case of my partner, David Miranda, the one thing I want to say about that is I hope that everyone understands how extreme and radical the UK government is when it comes to press freedoms. They are literally equating the reporting that we've done, not only with espionage, but with terrorism. The US State Department has for years condemned as tyrannical governments that equate journalists with terrorists or journalism with terrorism. And that is exactly what the UK government is doing in this case. And they have lots of other instances where they threaten core press freedoms of The Guardian and of the journalists who have been able to report on this story in a way that I think any country that overlooks what the UK government is doing loses all credibility when it comes to denouncing attacks on press freedom when engaged in by countries that aren't quite as familiar or that are allies of, of those governments. Okay, thank you. The next question is by Mr. Axel Voss on behalf of the EPP group. And I would like to talk in German. <clears throat> so, um, vielen Dank, Herr Greenwald, für Ihre Zeit und für Ihre Möglichkeiten, um, uns hier auch zur Verfügung zu stehen. Um, ich habe eigentlich mehr oder weniger drei kleine Fragen. Zum einen, um, wenn es ein ernsthaftes Anliegen ist, uns auf diese Situation und das, um, oder das Hineingreifen in die Privatsphäre um, eigentlich global gesehen sein soll, dann frage ich mich im Moment, ist eigentlich alles schon bekannt, was wir wissen sollten und ähm, oder ob dann noch was kommt an Informationen, von denen wir noch überrascht sein könnten, weil es für uns natürlich sehr wichtig wäre, was es vielleicht noch zusätzlich an Möglichkeiten gäbe. Dann hatten Sie Ausführungen gemacht, was man alles so abhören und mitbekommen kann. Ich frage mich nur im Moment, Bislang sind doch eigentlich Dinge veröffentlicht worden, die immer im nationalen oder beziehungsweise im, im Interesse der nationalen Sicherheit 
lagen oder das Interesse überhaupt national da war, so dass ich mich frage, das Beispiel, was Sie genannt hatten, hinsichtlich der Möglichkeiten, eine Abtreibungsklinik anzurufen, ob das tatsächlich im Interesse der NSA ist, solche Informationen auszuwerten. Dass es möglich ist, so etwas abzuhören oder zu kontrollieren, ist uns, glaube ich, mittlerweile allen bekannt. Aber ist es wirklich das Interesse, was da eine Rolle spielt? Und das Dritte wäre ähm, hinsichtlich äh, der Bedrohungen. Wir haben natürlich die Bedrohung sozusagen der Privatsphäre, die uns hier im Moment sehr beschäftigt. Aber was ist mit den Bedrohungen, die es sozusagen auf dieser Welt gegen Staaten auch gibt? Nicht nur in der ganzen elektronischen Welt, auch über fundamentalistische Strömungen. Und ist es denn da nicht durchaus aus Ihrer Sicht gerechtfertigt, in bestimmte Aufklärungsarbeit auch zu leisten, selbst wenn das ein oder andere damit ähm, aufgefischt wird, äh, was man eigentlich nicht auffischen sollte. Thank you, Mr. Greenwald. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for those questions. Um, as far as As, as far as we know, whether we know everything, um, we certainly know the gist of what these documents reveal, as I began by describing, that, that the NSA, the GCHQ, and allied governments are attempting to collect all forms of human electronic communication. There are still stories left that we are going to report that are significant. Uh, the documents are complicated, and as responsible journalists, it takes us a little bit of time to process them and, and report them accurately. Um, so we're doing it as fast as we can, consistent with being responsible and accurate. So there definitely are still stories that remain that I think are significant, but certainly after six months, I think everybody gets the fundamental point that drove Mr. Snowden to come forward, which is the menace posed by the surveillance system to everybody's individual privacy. Um, as far as the, the question about the NSA and whether it, it, it has an interest in, for example, collecting information about a woman getting an abortion or about people calling drug and alcohol clinics, I think to answer that question, all you have to do is look at recent history, not only in the United States, but in other countries as well. There is no instance where governments have developed the power to engage in secret, massive surveillance where it wasn't abused. For decades in the United States, the United States government used its surveillance authorities to monitor and eavesdrop on political dissidents and opponents of the government. The FBI famously tried to get evidence that Martin Luther King was having adulterous affairs and then threatened him or even tried to encourage him to commit suicide. There were decades of abuses that come from this system. I think it's widely understood that if human beings can exercise massive surveillance power in the dark with no accountability or transparency, that it's not likely but inevitable that it will be abused. And just three weeks ago, we reported that one of the things the NSA is doing is monitoring people, not who are engaged in terrorist activities or are members of terrorist organizations, but who express what the US government calls radical ideas, radical ideas, who have been targeted by the NSA, and the NSA is collecting information about their visits to pornographic sites or sexual chats that they have online with people who they're not married to. And the document we published contains plans to use that information to publicly humiliate and discredit those people to prevent them from effectively communicating their ideas to the world, a pure instance of abuse. So it may be true that the ordinary person who never challenges the government isn't going to be threatened with that kind of abuse because they're not challenging the government. But I don't think we want to create a society that says you won't be targeted with abusive surveillance as long as you just stay at home and mind your own business and never challenge the government. I think the measure of a free society is how it treats its dissidents and those who express ideas that deviate from the norm. Finally, on the issue of whether there's justifiable surveillance, I think the answer um, is of course there's, there's justifiable surveillance. Everybody agrees that when there's evidence that somebody is engaged in terrorist organizations or terrorist plots, that their conversations can be legitimately monitored. I think it should happen in a framework of accountability and the involvement of courts to make sure that it's not being abused. 
But that's not what this evidence and the documents show. The documents show whole populations being subjected to mass indiscriminate surveillance. And if you look at some of the specific cases that we've reported on, such as the targeting by the U.S. and the GCHQ of Petrobras, the oil giant, or the Organization of American States, or economic conferences where economic accords are being negotiated in Latin America, or spying on energy companies, such as we've reported in Norway and Sweden, what a lot of this spying is about has nothing to do with terrorism or national security. That is the pretext. It is about diplomatic manipulation and economic advantage and essentially the accumulation of power. Terrorism and national security are the banners that are waved to excuse it, but not the real purpose. These documents leave no doubt about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to be a bit more concise in answering, because otherwise we won't make it uh, in the time slot foreseen. Uh, I'm now changing hats and I'm now going to uh, ask a question on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group. My first question would be, uh, amongst all the, um, the, the, the countless targets that have been uh, revealed, there is one that is of particular interest to the European Parliament, and that is the server of a company called SWIFT, processing bank data. Uh, and there are apparently indications in the Snowden papers that say that the, the U.S. authorities have unauthorized access, or at least created the possibility of having unauthorized access. Um, do you have any more information on that? Second question, what makes a whistleblower a whistleblower is that um, he has exhausted all internal procedures for reporting wrongdoing. Um, is that the case um, with Mr. Snowden? What, what happened with the in internal procedures? My uh, third question would be, in your introduction, you singled out the UK as, a, uh, as a, a, an ally um, of the US. Are there any other particular European countries um, that you would like to, to highlight? And my final question is, following on a little bit from the question of Mr. Voss, uh, have you actually seen any evidence or any indications that information uh, has been used against political adversaries or that it would be allowed to use it, explicitly allowed to use it against political adversaries? Thank you. Uh, as far as the, the, the SWIFT banking um, system is concerned, the New York Times reported seven years ago that the U.S., the NSA, had targeted the SWIFT banking uh, system. The document that we published in Brazil on the targeting of Petrobras by the NSA and the GCHQ listed as among its targets the SWIFT banking system as well. That's the reporting that we've done so far. So clearly SWIFT is part of the targets of, of the NSA and the GCHQ. As far as being a whistleblower and exhausting all of the internal procedures, I think Mr. Snowden has explained that in the past, in past jobs that he had, when he brought wrongdoing to light, um, he was dismissed by his supervisors and told to go back to work and mind his own business, the same response that other whistleblowers like Chelsea Manning have received. But I think the most important point there is that there are senators on the Intelligence Committee um, of the United States who were aware of this wrongdoing and were trying to warn the public about it, but were constrained by law from even telling the public what it is that they had found out and were essentially rendered impotent. And so Mr. Snowden saw that even United States senators, had he gone to them, were barred by law from speaking out about it or doing anything about it and realized that his only recourse for making this public and getting action was to to make it public, that the internal systems for whistleblowers are, is really a farce. It's an illusion. It's designed to suppress the information and not to bring it to light. Um, as far as other European allies beyond the GCHQ, the UK, obviously the UK is the closest ally. Um, there is another level of cooperation beyond the Five Eyes program, which the U.S. calls the Nine Eyes or Tier B cooperation, where these governments cooperate with the NSA on a case-by-case -case basis for specific targeting purposes in Germany and France. Norway, Sweden, and Denmark are among the countries in Europe which participate most extensively with the NSA in these kinds of directed spying opportunity missions, and, and we publish documents setting that forth. Um, and then finally, as far as the evidence of using this uh, against political adversaries, I described the story that we published in the Huffington Post a couple of weeks ago in which the NSA plotted to use 
evidence of um, sexual activity on the internet in order to discredit and destroy the reputation of people that they consider to be purveyors of ideas they think are radical. Um, there's a lot more reporting that we have to do on that question that I just can't talk about because the documents aren't yet published and, and the reporting isn't yet done. Okay, thank you very much. Then the next um, question will be by Mr. Kirkhope on behalf of the uh, Conservative Group. Sorry, no, inverse order. Uh, Mr. Albrecht on behalf of the Green Group and Mr. Kirkhope after the Greens. Thank you very much. First of all, let me say uh, that I... Uh, Thank you for your work, because I think also without the independent uh, work of journalists, uh, journalists scrutinizing and reporting about these uh, documents, uh, we wouldn't have this discuss di discussion either. Uh, then let me ask uh, also three uh, questions. First, um, with regard to the awareness, uh, obviously uh, quite a lot of politicians uh, think that uh, citizens do not care about this. Um, what do you think about this? And uh, is there evidence in your view that uh, this topic and these questions, these fundamental questions, could play a role also in the... Uh, democratic decision-making process, for example, in elections uh, in the upcoming years. And uh, second question, uh, with regard to spying activities of uh, intelligence services, uh, do you have uh, uh, some uh, hints that there could be also economic interests involved in the spying activities of intelligence services, uh, for example, of the GCHQ uh, towards other EU member states? And um, so economic spying uh, interest. And the third question uh, is about uh, the work of journalists. Uh, as I said, I very much admire the work of independent journalists trying to scrutinize this information. But I heard from many sources, not only from yours, that the work of journalists and free press in Europe is endangered in that uh, uh, extent. And uh, my question would be, in how far you would see possibilities for us politicians to safeguard the work of a free press in Europe and worldwide. Um, and if you consider uh, going to the Strasbourg Human Rights Court on the obvious infringements uh, to the freedom of press in your work. Thank you. Mr. Greenwald. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you for the kind words. And, and as far as the question of whether or not citizens care, there's immense anecdotal and also empirical evidence that demonstrates how much they do. I think around the world, literally millions of people have been engaged by this reporting, have concluded that Mr. Snowden is, is heroic for what it is that he did. The fact that we here we are six months after the story began and the interest level around the world is as high as ever, um, I think is a testament to that. In the U.S., there is a very severe polling shifts in terms of people now for the first time since 9-11 viewing threats to their freedom and privacy from the government as being greater than and the threat of terrorism and, and all kinds of significant shifts in how people perceive these issues. And I think that continuing to make people aware of not only the severity of the threat, but the reason why it affects them so personally is instrumental to ensuring that people continue to, to take an interest in what the government, what governments are doing to their, to their privacy. Um, as far as the question of economic interest, as I indicated in my last response, there have been literally, I think, more than a dozen stories um, now about programs that have as their only goal uh, spying on economic entities for economic reasons, exactly what the U.S. and the West have Criticize China very vocally for doing is what the U.S., the GCHQ, and its allies are continuously doing as well. And I think, again, I'm, I'm hesitant to talk about reporting that we've not yet done, um, but Europe is by no means exempt when it comes to the U.S. and the GCHQ putting it under a surveillance microscope in terms of trade talks and other kinds of economic interests. Um, and then finally, on the question of a free press, um, you know, I think it's hard to o o overstate 
just how uh, successful the effort has been to intimidate journalists and their sources by the UK and the US. Um, I know I've, been re I've received all kinds of invitations over the last three or four months um, to attend events and speak at events in Europe, um, at private events, at organizations, at public events before government bodies, and have been advised by all kinds of lawyers that traveling to Europe as a journalist would be very dangerous for me because of the charges that the UK government is threatening to bring as a result of the journalism that I've been doing. And that's true for other people who are serving and working as journalists on this story um, and on other stories as well. And so I do hope that to the extent that any of you believe that the information that has been revealed has been at all helpful in, in fulfilling your duties as legislators, um, that you take steps to protect the journalists and, and especially the sources who have sacrificed their own interests to bring it all to light. Thank you. Then now it's the turn of Mr. Kirkhope. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, good morning, Mr. Greenwald. I assume it is morning where you are. Um, I want to deal perhaps more with the processes than your general observations. I would like to know, really, whether in the, uh, in the receipt of information, whether you received a complete copy of the files uh, originally from uh, Mr. Snowden, or whether you got them from an intermediary, additional documents or copies from the Guardian newspaper. And if not originals, did you get separately any other copies from any other source or a mix of the two? And the documents, you've talked a lot about documents and what they contain. I would like just to press you slightly on this. Um, what were the documents about? Um, were there signs of redaction, particularly redaction of the names of uh, intelligence agents? And also, you say on your Twitter account uh, that it was the Guardian's decision to give the GCHQ files to the New York Times. I want to know whether you got hold of that information or those files later, or did you already have them? Some people, Mr. Snowden, uh, Mr. Uh, Greenbelt, regard Mr. Snowden as a hero, I, I'm afraid I cannot join that club, but the reference to whistleblower, as I understand it, uh, the legal processes of the United States set down clear guidance as to how whistleblowers behave. There are protections for whistleblowers in the, e in the American Constitution and legal system. How is it, therefore, that we have no evidence that Mr. Snowden attempted at all to utilize what was legally available to him and frankly, therefore, left us with a situation that he could actually deal with these matters, you say, telling the world about it. Was that a responsible behavior of a man when security was so important? And finally, as a journalist, Mr. Greenwald, how do you determine yourself what is or what is not a matter of national security? Do you feel yourself qualified or equipped? I know you're no longer with The Guardian, do you feel yourself equipped and qualified to make such uh, enormous decisions? Thank you. Mr. Greenwald. So part of the part of freedom of the press, uh, uh, an important part of freedom of the press uh, that we've been talking about this morning is that fortunately journalists don't have to answer to government officials about what their sources gave them or how it is that they got the material. They're allowed to protect their sources and to protect their journalistic material from invasions by questions from the government, like the, some of the ones that, that you've just asked. Mr. Snowden is the source for the reporting that we've done at The Guardian, who specifically at The Guardian received the material and when they've received it, um, I think is, is not of anyone's concern. Um, Mr. Snowden has been identified as, his, as the source because he wanted to be identified as the source. Um, but beyond that, I'm not gonna answer questions about exactly when we got the documents or who at The Guardian got the documents or when we decided to share them with one another. Those are our internal matters as, as journalists and as newspaper, um, as a newspaper, and, and it's not for the government to intervene in that process. Um, as far as uh, what the documents are about, um, I think I've been very clear about what the documents are about. When Mr. Snowden came to us, he said that he had a large number of documents. Um, and if you think about it for a minute, and I think this is really crucial, he had a lot of choices in terms of what he could have done with those documents. He could have uploaded them all to the internet, he could have given them to an organization and asked that organization to disclose it all. 
He could have sold the documents to foreign intelligence services around the world and been very rich for the rest of his life. He didn't do any of that. He came to journalists um, that work with the largest and most respected news organizations in the world and asked us to be extremely judic judicious and careful in going through the material and publishing only that which is in the, in the, the public interest to know while not endangering any lives. And I think that everyone can see that we have adhered to those um, to those wishes. Uh, as far as whistleblower context protections are concerned, I'm not really sure where you got the idea that there are protections for whistleblowers in the U.S. Constitution. That's simply untrue. Um, and as far as whether there are protections for whistleblowers in the law, all you have to do is look at the fact that the Obama administration has actually prosecuted under espionage statutes more whistleblowers in the last five years than had been prosecuted in all of American history prior to President Obama becoming president. Um, and as I discussed earlier, these mechanisms that exist within the U.S. government are designed to suppress this kind of information and not to enable the public to learn about it. Um, and then finally, as, as, as in terms of the question of how I as a journalist um, make these decisions, the answer, the simple answer is I make them the same way that journalists around the world make these kind of decisions every single day. I work with the largest newspapers around the world, Le Monde in France, um, El Mundo in Spain, um, the biggest journalistic institutions in, in Brazil and Scandinavia, The Guardian, uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post are going through the same process. Um, we consult with experts, we meet with editors, we have a collaborative process, um, and we make certain that the information that we publish uh, doesn't put anyone's life in danger, and, and nobody has suggested that the information we publish has done so, but that we do our job as journalists, which is to overcome the desire of politicians to suppress this information and to demonize those people who bring it to light um, and make sure that people can know what their governments are doing because that's what democracy requires. Thank you. That brings us uh, first to Mrs. Gomez on behalf of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and then I have two more requests for the floor after that. Mrs. Gomez for two minutes. Mr. Greenwald, do you have any evidence that uh, uh, any European leader who has been spied by NSA has been blackmailed or could be blackmailed or intimidated in any way? Uh, my second question is, when we went to the United States uh, recently, we found out that uh, the different elements of the administration in, in Congress were at odds with what would come out. They had no strategy, and they were quite fearful. And at the same time, they were not taking responsibility uh, who, because there was all this game, well, the president was not aware, he ordered a review, and in Congress, the, the mood was also... Uh, dismissive. Uh, uh, what does it mean? Uh, what is that to come? Are we going to learn that NSA has been spying on the U.S. president? Uh, finally, you, there was a reference to uh, the intelligence, the cooperation with intelligence agencies and the lack of principles and adherence to the rule of law uh, uh, in that cooperation. I'd like to ask you, you mentioned a few more cooperative with the NSA methods. I'd like to ask about my country, Portugal. And if you can't give me an answer now, give me that some other time or some other way. Thank you. Mr. Greenwald. Sure. I, you know, as I've indicated, um, I'm, I'm hesitant to talk about the documents that we haven't yet reported, just because it's irresponsible for me to just start opining on documents that haven't gone through the journalistic process. Um, and so what I will say is that there are still a lot of stories about how the NSA uses and abuses its surveillance power um, that are not yet reported, but that we are working on. Um, as far as the question of blackmail is concerned, again, I would simply point to history as opposed to what documents might reveal that we haven't yet reported, um, in which surveillance powers have been abused exactly that way in, in all sorts of cases. And I think it would be quite naive to assume that suddenly for the first time in human history, uh, a massive surveillance state that operates in the dark isn't being used 
for those purposes. Um, as far as Portugal is concerned, uh, there's still lots of countries uh, where we intend to do very specific reporting in partnership with media organizations in those countries, um, and Portugal is one of them. So the only thing I can really say on that is that there is reporting coming um, regarding Portugal, and unfortunately, since we haven't done the reporting, I'm not able to be more specific. Thank you. Then I have two final um, questions. The first one by Mrs. Romero Lopez, and the last one I'll call is Mr. Engstrom. Mrs. Romero Lopez from the SD Group. Gracias, señor Greenwald. Gracias por su trabajo que nos ha permitido descubrir el mundo en el que vivimos y que ha sido tan útil. Eh, eh, quisiera preguntarle: ¿Usted cree que los, los metadatos son datos sensibles? Porque acabamos de tener unos expertos europeos que nos han confirmado que efectivamente los metadatos, eh, con solo dos localizaciones y una hora, se puede identificar a una persona. Si los, datos, eh, me, si los metadatos son datos sensibles, ¿usted cree que deben estar protegidos eh, en su país, en el Reino Unido? ¿Están protegidos ese, esos metadatos? Es muy importante la posición del Reino Unido en esta cuestión. Eh, ¿Usted cree que hay un movimiento para proteger esos metadatos? Thank you, Mr. Greenwald. Yeah, I talked earlier about why I actually think that the collection, the mass collection of metadata is more invasive than even the interception of content, the ability to read people's emails or listening to their telephone calls. And the court decision that we talked about earlier that came out in the United States that found that the NSA's metadata program violated the privacy rights of Americans is extremely compelling about why metadata is so invasive. And I really would encourage you to read it. And what the judge essentially said was that the idea that metadata um, is simply a list of relatively harmless information is really antiquated. It's from an era where communications were radically different than they are now. Given technology and what we use our phones for and what governments have been able to do in terms of analyzing metadata, um, metadata really is what the focal point of these surveillance agencies is because they learn more about metadata, for, for, about people from metadata analysis than they do about content interception. And I'm glad you brought up the UK because when it comes to European metadata, um, the NSA plays a very important role, but it is the UK through their interception of underwater fiber optic cables and their invasion into all sorts of systems, including by very controversial means of hacking, as Der Spiegel has reported, that is a primary threat to the privacy of European citizens when it comes to their telephone and email communications, at least as much, if not more so, than the NSA. Thank you. Uh, the last speaker on the list, Mr. Engström. Thank you. Uh, I come from Sweden, and uh, as you know, la last week Swe Swedish television uh, showed the program where, where you were one of the reporters, uh, showing how, how the Swedish security agency, FRA, are, first of all, very, very intimately connected to the NSA, and second, that, that they play an active part in, in actually breaking into computers. Uh, and I think that, that, that was a new re revelation that, that, that uh, sh shocked people in Sweden. And I'm ha happy, to, happy to tell you that, that uh, this has created quite, quite a lot of, of uh, attention in Sweden. And uh, at the moment, we, we have the government uh, basically saying that they hope that all laws have been followed. So I get the impression that, that if there are more revelations, that they're planning to, to distance themselves and, and be able to, to blame uh, the, the security agency itself. So, uh, yeah, my question would be, we, uh, will, there be will there be more, more on, on, on the Swedish, uh, on, on the FRA uh, thing? And in general, will, will, will there be more reporting on, on the involvement of, of European governments? Uh, because I think that's uh, an issue that, that is of particular interest to, to, to us here. And as a last question, you mentioned uh, not jeopardizing lives. Uh, can I feel confident that, that you, you're thinking about your own security and the security of everybody else who has access to the material so, so that it's not even a theoretical option for, for security services to suppress the, the material by, well, uh, by, by killing you off? Mr. Greenwald. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that concern, first of all. Um, I'm glad you asked about the Swedish television report because there, it leads to a point I wanted to emphasize, um, which is we spent a long time talking about metadata this morning. But one of the revelations that we that our sweet that our reporting in Sweden um, demonstrated was that the spying, including mass indiscriminate spying, goes far beyond metadata. One of the reports that that we did in Sweden was about the program X Key Score, which is a very important program for the NSA and the GCHQ. Um, but they also have now started to allow their closest surveillance partners, such as Sweden, access to this program. And this program nothing to do or very little to do with metadata. It's about the ability to store emails and read them at will, to collect people's browsing histories, their chat logs, and their Google searches, essentially the content of communications of what is being done on the Internet as well. That is very much a part of how privacy is being invaded. It is not just metadata. There are programs, including PRISM, that are all about content and not just metadata. Um, as far as European governments are concerned, um, it is true, and, and this was part of how the story evolved, that governments in Germany and France expressed indignation when we did our first reports that the NSA was targeting their countries only for it to turn out that those countries subject their own populations to similar types of surveillance and even cooperate with the NSA. Um, but at the same time, Nobody really competes, certainly not in Europe, with the NSA and the GCHQ when it comes to the level of invasiveness, the amount of resources that go into it, and the objective and the mission to collect all forms of electronic communication. So it is true that a lot of our reporting has been about European governments, and that will continue. Um, but. The U.S. and the U.K. really are on a different level when it comes to both their ability to destroy privacy and their desire to do so. Um, and then finally about my own security and the security of the people reporting on this, we've definitely taken a lot of steps to ensure that there are multiple copies of these documents um, in various places around the world, very safe and very secure, um, but that eliminating somebody's ability to work on them would not in any way impede the, the ability to do the reporting. Reporting on these materials is inevitable. Um, I've been particularly fortunate to be in a, in a country, Brazil, whose government is very appreciative of this reporting and who understands the need to support and protect a free press um, from the assault by the U.S. and the U.K. on our ability to do the reporting. And so I think we all feel as, as confident as we can um, that this reporting is going to happen and that nobody can stop it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, with that, we've exhausted um, our list of speakers. Uh, on behalf of this committee, I would like to thank you very much for uh, your time and your willingness to answer our questions. Um, and I think that everybody is, uh, is uh, waiting with uh, uh, great curiosity and interest for further publications, in particular on the issues uh, that you said you, you couldn't answer our questions uh, on because it has not yet been published. And as a, as a final remark, I think uh, one of the things that sets a democracy apart from uh, an authoritarian regime is that, yes, we have secret services, but we also have democratic oversight. Uh, and clearly, free press plays a role in that, but there is also uh, parliamentary oversight. Uh, and we feel that um, as a European Parliament, we have very limited means to, to exercise uh, oversight. We do what we can, but of course, we'd be extremely grateful for any information. Uh, if you would feel the urge to share that with somebody, um, then we'd be very interested. So thank you very much um, for your time. And um, that concludes this session. Goodbye. All right, colleagues, um, it's 25. We have 25 minutes left. And the last item on the agenda is um, the presentation. The, the presentation um, uh, of the, the, the first draft of our rapporteur, Mr. Moraz. Uh, but I understand there will be an oral presentation only at this stage, and the text will follow later. Mr. Moraz, you have the floor. Thanks, Sophie. If I just wait for the mass exodus, <laughs> if I just wait for the mass exodus, <laughs> I'm not Glenn Greenwald, as you know. Um, I can do this uh, fairly quickly. Um, first of all, just to explain to colleagues, um, all the shadows 
um, who are chatting. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's okay. No, no, it's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's okay. You're entitled to chat to the Guardian. It's fine. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Not anymore. <laughs> um, just by way of a, um, ex explanation, all the shadows will receive the report, which I have in my hand, very thick, um, on Friday. Um, the reason is a slight um, postponement is I want to incorporate a number of other issues which have arisen this week, including the analysis of the federal court uh, judgment and some other aspects arising from the uh, delegation visit. And uh, we came across a number of other amendments which we needed to make uh, in discussion with the Secretariat, and they are substantive amendments. So with your patience, uh, we're going to do that and give it to the shadows, all the shadow rapporteurs on Friday. Uh, so at least you, if, if you should so wish, you can read it over Christmas. I'm not compelling anyone to do that. Um, but uh, if, you, if, you, if, if, you, if you really would like to study that over Christmas, um, then that's something you can do. Uh, but I want to do that because I don't want anyone to feel that we, we didn't meet our deadlines. Um, that would then take the timetable to um, uh, schedule a discussion on the 9th of January. Uh, Sophie, if that's okay. And then I, I think the deadline for amendments could remain if, no, if there's no objection uh, for the 13th of January. I'm happy to um, shift that, but I think the deadline could remain for the 13th. Um, if it goes out on Friday. Um, what, I, what I just propose to do now is just to give um, colleagues a sense of um, where the report is and to do that probably most successfully is just to give a sense of what the recommendations would be, uh, which I think is probably the best way to do it. And that's just going to take a, just a few minutes. Um, and I think that's probably the best way uh, to, to go through things. Um, to... Um, touch on the recommendations. The narrative of the report, of course, we've had the six working group reports, but my report um, will touch on uh, recommendations which will um, address the member states, the institutions, and our relationship between the EU and the US. Um, so first of all, um, in relation to the EU and US, of course, I'm working with the um, Foreign Affairs Committee, and we uh, final, finalised our paragraphs uh, with them yesterday. Um, and in relation to that, first of all, uh, the recommendations that I'll, I'll be making um, will talk about um, continuing our strengthening uh, relationship with Congress, which I think all colleagues uh, uh, recognise was a good thing. Uh, we have differences of opinion, but um, I talk about um, those sorts of issues. Then the substantive parts of my report in terms of um, uh, those recommendations. Uh, we began the inquiry with um, uh, journalism, freedom of the press, and whistleblowing and so on. Throughout the inquiry, the Libe Committee um, began and heard um, statements from journalists and whistleblowers from civil society. Um, and the report will therefore call on the Commission to issue a comprehensive report um, on whistleblowing uh, to include the field of security. Um, on IT security, again, the disclosures have exposed a huge weakness in IT security of EU institutions. Uh, right up until today, we've heard that evidence. Um, it was further highlighted by the reports last month by French newspapers that hackers were able to access MEP and staff emails without much effort. In response to this, the report will um, talk about review and assessment of technical capabilities, including possible open source software, the use of cloud storage by the Parliament, the impact of increased use of mobile tools, and a plan for the use of encryption technologies. Um, I'll talk about EU cloud computing, uh, recognising the importance of a swift development of the EU cloud as it ensures uh, protections for EU citizens' data, given that any data they store in cloud cloud of US companies can potentially be accessed by the NSA. An EU cloud would ensure that business, businesses apply the high standards of EU data protection rules. And in addition, uh, I'll look at positive aspects of um, disclosures and the, potential, and the potential economic advantage it can bring uh, to EU business. In terms of TTIP, uh, my draft report will recognise the major importance of TTIP, of course, for 
economic and job growth. Um, however, I will strongly underline, given the importance of rebuilding EU-US trust, that the Parliament should only consent to the final TTIP agreement, provided that there are no references to data protection provisions within the text of the agreement. We need to ensure that strong data privacy protections are achieved separately from TTIP. On the EU-US data protection framework agreement, the umbrella agreement, I'll welcome the Commission's aim of adopting this agreement by spring 2014. The main importance of this is to provide judicial redress for EU citizens when their personal data is transferred to the US. At the moment, the EU citizens, of course, don't enjoy full and reciprocal judicial uh, redress rights as access to US courts are, of course, guaranteed only to US persons. On top of this, um, completing the negotiations would restore trust in transatlantic data transfers. On EU data protection reform, I'll talk about specifically calling on the Council to begin work on the, the data protection package uh, so that an agreement is reached by 2014 at the latest. In addition, I'll reiterate the importance of both the regulation and, and the directive being adopted as a package. Uh, Parliament, of course, has already sent a strong message under this, under the rapporteurship of Jan Albrecht, so it's for the Council to start working immediately, and that will be a, an important part of my report as well. On TFTP, in accordance with the EP resolution, the draft report will call for, or will, will talk about the suspension of the current TFTP agreement until the conditions as laid out in our resolutions have been met. Um, and it will, it will pursue that narrative, um, and that's something that um, colleagues will have to study in terms of uh, their own amendments. On Safe Harbour, the report will reiterate the message from the working document with Axel Voss uh, on calling on the Commission to suspend the safe harbour principles which allow US companies to transfer data of EU citizens to the US while providing an adequate uh, level of protection. There are a whole number of other uh, recommendations, but I wanted to cite these recommendations to show that the report is sort of action orientated and deals with substance um, and also follows the narrative um, of the inquiry. Um, and takes seriously the way that the story of the inquiry um, went from journalism and whistleblowing through what I thought was an outstanding um, set of invitations put together by our Secretariat and, of course, the Shadow Rapporteurs um, right up until today. Um, and I'm trying to follow that narrative in the, in the draft report. Of course, that has to be amended by our shadow rapporteurs and members, um, many of the active ones who have been coming here um, to the inquiry, but of course some members outside the inquiry too. Um, so that's a taste of the kind of recommendations that will be in the report, but I'll send it out to shadows on Friday and perhaps they could study it in more detail uh, with the deadline for amendments being on the 13th. Okay, well I can't wait until the Christmas break. <laughs> um, any members want to come in? Anna Gomez? Just to say how much uh, I believe uh, the co raptors uh, of the opinion on AFET uh, appreciated cooperating with uh, uh, Claude Moraes' uh, Libre Rapporteur and how important it is for us, as he has stressed, this question of uh, asking for uh, the umbrella pressing for the umbrella agreement on data protection and in particular uh, uh, making the case for the, the need for judicial and administrative redress for European citizens in the US. I think from the contacts we had yesterday with the US uh, Congress uh, delegation, we could see that they do not understand, may, some may not understand but others may not want to understand what we mean. And this is really a crucial question. So I think this is duly highlighted in Claude Moraes' uh, report. And uh, of course, I will dispense myself from other considerations, but then I think this is the central question. I'll, I'll first invite uh, Axel Voss, who wants to make a remark, and then I want to make one, then we'll come back to the rapporteur. Axel? Vielen Dank. Um, ich Ich habe schon das Gefühl, auch aufgrund der Äußerungen von äh, Claude Moraes, dem Berichterstatter, dass wir hier, glaube ich, ein ganz gutes Ergebnis auch erzielen werden. Ich möchte 
ähm, dem Berichterstatter und aber auch dem Sekretariat recht herzlich danken für diese viele Arbeit, die aufgrund dieser vielen Anhörungen auch gemacht werden musste in einer Zeitspanne, ähm, die auch bei uns so nicht üblich ist. Von daher recht herzlichen Dank für die ganzen Mühen. Ähm, ich wollte noch auf einen anderen Aspekt hinweisen. Und zwar haben wir jedoch im Moment auch im Haus das, die, die Diskussion über das sogenannte Telekom-Paket mit allen Facetten. Wenn wir es meines Erachtens ernst meinen, auch mit unseren Empfehlungen, dann meine ich, sollte vielleicht diese Verabschiedung dieses Paketes auch noch so lange warten, bis vielleicht das ein oder andere von dem, was wir verwenden können, von unseren Empfehlungen auch dort Einfluss finden. Von daher würde ich den Berichterstatter bitten, vielleicht mal auszuloten, herauszufinden, wie es möglich ist, dass vielleicht die ein oder andere Empfehlung auch dort noch verwirklicht werden könnte. Ich weiß, dass das sehr unter Zeitdruck steht, dieses andere im Moment. Aber vielleicht meine ich, wenn wir schon mal beginnen wollen, mit auch etwas umzusetzen, dann wäre das hier eine gute Möglichkeit. Okay, thank you. Unless any other members on the floor? No. Uh, just two remarks uh, on behalf of my group. Uh, one is, and you may have you may you may have touched upon this, but then it has escaped my attention. But one is, I, I think many people have seen this inquiry as um, you know a traditional parliamentary inquiry where we uh, uh, we dig up new evidence. Clearly, that's not the kind of inquiry. That we are able to do, but I do think that it is it is necessary to start the whole report with an overview of what has taken place and in which which way that has violated uh, European laws and the rights of European citizens. I think it's that's important. And the uh, second uh, point, and we there there's a, a working document on that, so I suppose that's also going to be integral part of the report. Is indeed on oversight mechanisms who have clearly failed uh, at, at you know in, in some instances they may have worked better in other instances they failed completely but it's clear that there is uh, that there is a challenge there and not only because of the strength of the oversight mechanisms but also simply because of the uh, expansion of um, uh, cross-border cooperation there is simply something that is escaping the national oversight mechanisms because they simply don't have the powers Uh, and I also felt, uh, uh, as, as I said uh, in my conclusion to Mr. Greenwald, um, we seem to be the only parliament that is tackling this, this whole thing. But of course, we are severely uh, constrained by, by the lack of powers. We cannot hear people under oath. We have, we have very, you know, we have no access to classified information. Um, uh, we, we have the, the public arena as our only weapon, but I think we should give some very serious thought about the role of this parliament in future oversight mechanisms uh, if, we want, if we want more cross-border cooperation, then we also need more oversight, and I hope that that's going to be um, one of the recommendations as well. Okay, well, that basically... Oh, sorry, yes, of course. Thanks, Sophie. Can I just test your patience for... Just another minute, just to uh, conclude, Sophie, if that's okay. Um, I, I was rather not very passionate and very dry in my delivery, I realise at the beginning. That's only tiredness before Christmas. Um, I just want to say two, a couple of things. First of all, I deliberately didn't talk about the working documents that all of you have put together. I think this has been a very good exercise because, for example, in Oversight or on Safe Harbour, which Axel is doing, um, what Jan is doing and so on, Then Anna talked about the Foreign Affairs Committee. I think that has worked very well. But secondly, I do want to make the point that we are dealing with such a sensitive area. And I do want to say to colleagues, and I want to say this publicly in the committee, that it has been a very sensitive issue. We have had quite a few challenges. So I would like to thank my colleagues for their cooperation. It's been a very big test, um, you know, and it's been quite stressful uh, to thank them. I'd like to also, and Axel um, made this point, um, I've seen up close how the Secretariat has worked, Antoine and Jose Manuel and so on, what they did in Washington. I mean, it has been an ex quite an extraordinary effort. You see um, all these witnesses turning up. This has been quite an extraordinary effort. No other inquiry has put together this much in such a short space of time. And I think colleagues beyond our inquiry have been quite surprised 
This is due to their work. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with them. It's just before Christmas. I don't know what they're going to do to me after uh, in January. I'll get dumped. Uh, but um, um, I, think, I, think it, I think it's enhanced the reputations of all of our shadows, and I think we should collectively thank the Secretariat for that. Um, uh, the, uh, I think Antoine and his team have done a brilliant job. Um, and, and finally, just to say, um, you know, please um, analyse what, what I've done, because my document, um, which I've very dispassionately talked about deliberately, um, needs to be taken apart a bit because it will maybe step into some of your areas um, and I'd want this to be a collective parliament inquiry. And finally, Sophie, you said that um, this is not like a, it, this is not a, a court of law. We're not a court of law. Uh, we don't take uh, actual evidence. There's going to be a lot of grey areas. So do analyse it, maybe not over Christmas, but analyse it to see where the overlaps are. Uh, so that we can have some collective piece of work. And Axel, I will look at this telecoms point. I think that's a very good point. And, and what you're implying in what you've just said is that the CP, the CP inquiry, despite what people have been thinking, which had a very low expectation, might have a more substantive uh, recommendation and outcome than we thought. So what I'm going to aim to do is to raise the expectation a little bit, so to have recommendations which might last into the next mandate uh, so that we set something up that can continue into the next mandate. So make the recommendations a bit strong. So when you view the, the recommendations I'm making in the report alongside your working documents, um, have a view to recommendations which last, which are quite strong, um, so that this is not just like a, a, a one-hit wonder so that something that lasts into the next mandate, that we tell the Commission to do something that is realistic and lasts and so on, um, that we're a little bit bold. This is what I think um, it, I'm perceiving uh, that can be done. So that's the final word, I would say. Um, so, and thank you all just before Christmas. Everyone's tired. <laughs> well, thank you. One last short intervention by Mr. Albrecht. I just would like to add that I fully agree with the comments and would like to thank personally and on behalf of my group to the Rapporteur and to the Secretariat for organizing all the hearings. Thank you and good Christmas. Thank you. Well, I, 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 I subscribe to that, uh, both standing thanks to the Secretariat who've been working like mad in addition to other big dossiers like the data protection package um, and, and my thanks to the Rapporteur. But I think there's still you know, enough work left uh, in the first months of next year to prevent you from falling into a post-inquiry depression. So, you know, don't worry. Um, I would like to thank everybody, wish everybody excellent holidays and all the best for the new year. And the inter of course the interpreters, they're included in everybody. I'm looking around. Thank you to the interpreters also for... No, you're not actually staying longer. I think it was foreseen until one. But thank you all the same and all the best wishes for the holidays. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's been following this very loyally. I wish you excellent holidays.